softing, not heavy. He hears me as wise and not dull. He thinks that I'm super terrific when others think nothing at all. He hears me as funny, not silly, and graceful as Fred Astaire. And he doesn't notice the gray. He says I have lavender hair. He cleans up my mess in the kitchen. He irons his clothes and mine too. He's shy, but he'll go on the dance floor. What I want him to do. His kisses are soft and yet manly. He mentions me in his prayer, and he doesn't notice the gray. He said I have lavender hair. All alone in the moonlight, stars watch from above. One says they're starting to look alike. The other says, could this be love? Sometimes he yells about money and makes me feel small. But he is the only honey I want to cuddle by the fire in the fall. I never said he was perfect. His romantic gestures are rare. But he doesn't notice the gray. He said I have lavender hair. Thank you. <laughs> Shalom and welcome to this special edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heart lines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and you have just seen the video of our guest, and we are very, very delighted to have Victoria Jackson, author of Lavender Hair, 21 Devotions for Women with Breast Cancer. Victoria, great to have you on the program. Thank you, Rabbi. So good to see you. Most everyone knows you for your six seasons on Saturday Night Live, and you've appeared in many films. You were raised in a Bible-believing, piano-playing home with no TV. While at college on a gymnastics scholarship, you discovered drama, Johnny Carson's talent scout saw her six-minute stand-up comedy act and put her on The Tonight Show, where she appeared over 20 times. In 1992, Victoria was reunited with her high school sweetheart and left show business to raise a family in the suburbs of Miami. She still performs stand-up comedy and appears in an occasional film. She and her husband now reside in Nashville, Tennessee, to be near their daughters and grandchildren. Uh, Victoria, we remember you, of course, from your comedy appearance today for the many roles you played on Saturday Night Live, but what most people don't know about you is that you have been a woman of faith all your life, and you were a Christian working in a very secular show business world. Yes. Uh, they didn't know that for the first 10 years of my career because uh, I never thought, would, can you hear me very well? I can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, this whole Skype cyber world is all new to me. It's okay. So it's just... really, you just, we're fine. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I didn't think it was appropriate on my first 20 Johnny Carsons to go, John 316, people. I, sometimes I wished I, I could just go, we're all going to hell. We need Jesus. I thought, they'll think I'm insane. I'll never work again, and it probably won't help the kingdom. So I just decided to do the best I can, try to be funny, be professional, show up on time, uh, and um, love everyone, and uh, like Jesus loves them, and... And then when in my in the nineties, when I was a homemaker housewife mother in Florida, I got invited to politically incorrect with Bill Maher. And I thought that was an appropriate time to stand up for Jesus, especially because he pitted me against four atheists and uh, sometimes I brought my Bible with me. I was on twelve times and 
that's when America found out I was a Christian, I think. And did that change Hollywood's attitude towards you? <sighs> I think that being a political conservative blacklisted me. Not so much being a Christian. I, I mean, I, I, I was getting a lot less opportunities in the 90s, but it might have been because I was older, not living in L.A., fatter. You know, I can't blame it on coming out of the closet as a Christian, although I'm sure and I know it. It, it made me lose jobs. But what really made me lose jobs was political conservatism. And what made me lose the most jobs was when I publicly said that primetime TV should not have homosexual themes because children are watching. Innocent minds, children are watching. And that really got me a huge wave of hate. And I lost two agents lots of jobs, um, and I kind of knew that would happen. It's just that I felt like a whole generation of kids is being brainwashed to think that homosexuality is, a, is normal, and I thought there should be one voice out there saying, there is another way to look at this. Uh, Jesus loves everyone equally, and we're all sinners, but the Bible does not condone homosexuality and God knows your life would be much happier if you didn't go down that path. And anyway, so, so you, did I you, answer that? Right. So you've seen a drop off in the number of bookings that you have uh, received. You're not getting the casting calls you used to get. You're not getting the auditions you used to get. You're still doing the Zanies clubs because he likes you and and mm -hmm. uh, you have a good relationship there. Uh, but uh, your conservative position, and especially in light of what's going on today about the, you know, it's interesting. I wrote an op-ed called Shock and Awe. Uh, it's our fault. Eighty years ago, the term casting couch came into vogue. We mm -hmm. all knew what it meant, but nobody ever spoke out against it. And now all of a sudden you have one person that becomes the poster child for the casting couch, and we have this trickle-down effect, uh, but it was something that people just accepted. And this is how uh, immorality and the eroding, uh, compromising value system of America happens is that when things come out, there's not an outrage. There's not an outcry. They take a wait and see, not a rush to judgment, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it becomes acceptable and nobody talks about it. Now, 80 years later, it's unacceptable, but it's only unacceptable to what? Certain people? Is this something that you were exposed to when you were working Saturday Night Live? Were there opportunities presented to you that if you would be uh, um, physically available uh, mm. for favors that uh, things would be offered to you? <clears throat> wow. It's an interesting topic. What's crazy to me is that liberals are turning on liberals about this whole sexual harassment thing. It's like, wow. Um, basically, when I grew up, I assumed that there was a casting couch, and I knew that if I was ever in that situation, I would say, uh-uh, nope, I'm a Christian, I don't do anything like that. Um, I thought, well, if I lose jobs, then it's, you know, good, I'm standing up for Jesus. But I never, I've never had encountered the casting couch. I have never lost a job because I wouldn't do a sexual favor. Ever. That's never happened to me. Um, not, never happened at Saturday Night Live. Uh, I have had sexual harassment in different, lots of different situations on the street and my secretary job. Um, a, a couple people kissed me without... <laughs> you know, without me telling them they could. Um, 
at SNL and not at SNL in an office where I was a typist. A guy I never, I never met came in. I mean, there. I I keep thinking of stories. I mean, I did audition for a movie for Warren Beatty in an office, and I got a call back, and they said go to his house, and I said go to his house. Is that how it's done in the big time, in the big, big show business Hollywood time? You go to the movie stars' houses, and they're like, I guess. My, my agent said that. So I took my, this was in 1985. So I took my husband with me because I thought that was kind of weird. It was on Mulholland, where all the movie stars are, and Warren Beatty answered the door in a towel. And... I, I I was trying to think fast, and I said, should we have dressed more casually? <laughs> Which I think is a great line. I'm yeah. very proud I thought of that so quickly. And then he laughed, and then we came in, and then like 15 people showed up to read the script. And um, uh, when I was leaving, I asked his assistant, um, does, does Warren always answer the door in a towel, and the guy said, oh, he was just being polite. He sunbathes in the nude. And so that was my experience, but nobody, you know, did said I wouldn't get the movie if I didn't do anything. Uh, I was three months pregnant at the time, but nobody knew it. Uh, I was trying to get work and uh, had my baby. I got a call. You got the movie. Uh, we're the pickup artist. We're going to shoot it in two months. So I had to lose 45 pounds in two months. And uh, we shot the movie. And I, I, I'm, you know, so that's one of my funny little stories. But I've never encountered the casting couch. Well, but you're aware of it. I am aware of it. And I, I've seen, you know, awkward situations. Um, I also think it's very hypocritical or weird that Hollywood, who puts out movies about naked orgies and every kind of sexual immorality you can think of, would be so shocked at some producer or something making a move on some, I mean, the movie that they're making is usually sexually immoral, like way past any thing I could ever think of you know what I mean so it's so funny like really you're you're offended that he came on to you but you're doing a naked love scene and he's producing that I, you know well there seems you know to be I mean? a lot of hypocrisy a lot of double standards but when you have no standards then any standard will do yeah oh I have one more thought on that um when I grew up in the Bible I, I never expect unbelievers to act like a believer. I mean, if you don't serve Jesus or try to please him or follow the Bible, then you have then you just do whatever you want. And I, I've never been shocked that a man would, I've never been shocked that anyone would do anything if they're not a Jesus follower. You see what I mean? So what's the big surprise? They they don't answer to God. They they're answering just to themselves. So what's the surprise if they, you know? Well, they kind of do what they're expected to do, which is what a heathen or a non-believer might do. In the right. in the six years that uh, six seasons, what were the circumstances? Why did you leave after six seasons? Was there, was there a change in the program? Was there a change in the casting? What was the, uh, uh, the change that took place after six years? Moody Bible Commentary. I love it. I, I just realized I could look skinnier. I can look skinnier if I put the camera higher. Yeah, I forgot. Oh, so your question is, why did I leave after six years? Yes. Well, uh, my contract was for five years. My my cast, we our contract was for five years. And um, we had to write our own material. Uh, I Most of my best stuff, I did not write. Um, guys from Harvard, smart guys like 
Jack Handy and Robert Smigel, and they wrote most of my good stuff. But like, it wasn't like they were writing for me. They would just write something, and I was lucky if I got in it. So we had to come up with our own ideas. Now, after five years, we were all getting burnt out. My cast was Dana Carvey, the church lady, and um, John Lovitz, you know, the character The Liar, and Phil Hartman, and Dennis Miller, and Kevin Nealon. And, you know, we were all, like, kind of getting burned out. Plus, you don't sleep much. And Lauren said I could stay as long as I want when my contract came up. So I stayed another year. And then I was going through a divorce from my first husband. And my daughter was four. And I didn't want her to be at home with no dad and no mom. And I just, I thought it was time to go. And most of my cast was leaving. All of my cast was leaving. Only two of them stayed longer. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a very nice parting. Lauren Michaels said I could stay as long as I want. I wasn't fired. I wasn't fired for being a Christian. Lauren Michaels was very open-minded and he was, he was very kind to me and very supportive of me and gave me that job because he thought I was funny. And sometimes if there was like bad words in the script or taking God's name in vain, I would not say it and nobody said anything. I'll just go, Oh, bummer or something like that instead of take his name in vain. And, and, uh, we were allowed to say, I don't want to be in that sketch or, you know, something like that. A couple of them were like a gray area and, you know, one of them I probably shouldn't have done, but it, it wasn't as, it wasn't as immoral then in the eighties as it is now. I think, you know, they keep pushing the line. Right. And we're seeing that with society. Society keeps shifting the line and keeps moving the mark so that uh, um, you don't really know what the clear line is unless you believe in the Bible. Uh, right. Right. You don't know right and wrong unless you read the Bible every day, love it, believe in it, and try to follow it, then you, you can put the line wherever you want to put the line. Right. Now, you've also appeared in a number of films. Uh, what were some of those films you were in? Well, uh, back when I was young and people wanted to look at me, I was in, uh, I was in uh, UHF with Weird Al Yankovic. I was in a movie with Sean Connery and Dustin Hoffman called a Family Business that was directed by Sidney Lumet. I was in um, Baby Boom with Diane Keaton. Uh, I, you know, most of the movies I was in were not a huge hit. So I think if you're in a huge hit, I think that does help your movie career. But you, know. but you still have a desire to be out there doing comedy and you still want to be out back in the show business. I love making people laugh more than anything, and I get to do it uh, now and then. I just did, you know, stand up. I just did Huckabee, you know, Huckabee's new show on TBN. Yes. Uh, I did stand up on there and played a ukulele song, and that's going to be airing on New Year's Eve, December 30th and 31st on TBN. That was so fun. I felt like I was on Johnny Carson again because I had a mic. Live audience, Huckabee was sitting there like Johnny Carson used to. And I was like, hey, is that too edgy for a TBN? And, um, yeah, it was so fun. It was really, really fun. And then I plugged my new book, you know, about cancer and tried to encourage people, hey, cancer's not so scary. God can carry you through anything. So let's go to that day. It was uh, October 8th, 2015. You were getting ready for a 45-minute stand-up routine. Uh, instead of enjoying the pre-show and segment, you were lying on a couch in the green room coughing non-stop. Take <laughs> us to that day. And was that at Zany's? Zany's in Nashville. And... Uh... I never go to the doctor. I'm never sick. And so I went to the walk-in clinic the next day. 
because you can't hardly do a 45 minute stand up routine if you're coughing on the punchline. You know, two blondes walk into a building. <coughs> you think one of them would have seen it. <coughs> you know, it kind of ruins the timing. So um, I, I went to the walk-in clinic. I said, uh, I have a cough. It won't go away. But also there's a numb spot right here. Is that my lymph nodes fighting my cough? And I'd had it for three days, and I thought, that's weird. And the, got the male nurse named Gordon, thank you, Gordon, he, he said, you're going to the Vanderbilt Breast Clinic immediately. And I was like, why? Cancer doesn't run in my family. And uh they said I had it growing in me for five to ten years. So I had double mastectomy, radiation, chemo, went bald, and uh, it was quite a journey. When you look back on that journey, knowing the comedian that you are, trying to find the funny spots, the funny moments, <laughs> the life-sustaining things, the things to harvest, probably even looking for new material uh, the whole time because that's your natural inclination. What was it that really sustained you the most? Because you're now, what, three years cancer-free? Two years. Two years cancer-free. Uh, and in that time, you're bounced back. You're back out there. You just did a benefit, a book release at Zany's uh, a month ago where you rolled out uh, Lavender hair, and uh, to a great audience there who loves you, and they keep bringing you back there. Uh, so, what was it that sustained you through this? First of all, how did you deal with the shock of the diagnosis? Well, the shock. My first thought was, it's about time for me to have a tragedy because my life has been pretty pretty good. My old my daughter when she was 18 was in a car accident and her and her two friends and they almost died and they did not die god god healed them and that would have been the hardest thing a person i could have gone through but she's alive and she's perfectly well thank you lord um so i thought hey it's about time for me to have a tragedy and how, the, what got me through it was God's word. God's word is powerful and it's true. And, and I, I would quote Psalm 23 out loud or I would sing it when I was bald, full of poison from chemo, laying in my bed and I was so weak I couldn't hardly change the remote control of the TV. And I would just say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And I felt like Jesus was standing right there next to me. And I was like, Lord, am I going to heaven soon? Am I dying soon? Uh, and and uh, I thought, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That verse kept coming into my head. I would walk down the street, and there's a cemetery, and there's a gravestone there. And it says that verse on it, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I would open my Bible and I would fall to that. It was just like the verse that kept coming through the whole time. And, you know, cancer can come back. We're all going to die. And God's word has so much hope in it. It's like this life is a vapor. And eternity with him is, we can't even comprehend how great it would be. But uh, that's what really carried me through. All the verses that I memorized in Christian school and Bible college, I, I was living them. I wasn't just saying them or reading them. I was living them out. We're talking with Victoria Jackson, uh, best known for her six seasons on Saturday Night Live, but now known as my new friend and mm -hmm. someone that I've already had We've already had about six interviews together trying to get the technology to work. So we've had probably more time together uh, <laughs> off air, on air than you'll ever see. Uh, it has been such a delight. But she wrote a devotional, 21 Devotions for Women with Breast Cancer. And uh, 
she takes you on a journey of answering questions, why me? And the one that most, I think, struggle with, probably more than many will admit, is a lollipop addiction a cause of cancer? It's a very important question with a very important answer that we're going to touch on that and lavender hair with Victoria Jackson, 21 devotions for women with breast cancer. When we come back from this break, we'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, executive director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatian Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth 
like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're having a delightful visit with Victoria Jackson, author of Lavender Hair, 21 Devotions for Women with Breast Cancer. Now, when we opened the show, we opened with your uh, video on uh, you playing uh, the ukulele and singing Lavender Hair, but you also wrote another song uh, while you had cancer. Why don't you uh, share that one with us now? Okay, I'll just do a little bit. <clears throat> it's a broken world, baby. That's the name of it, because everybody has a cross to bear. Everybody has a burden, even if it's not, it's not cancer. Tattoo of a broken ukulele. Light blue turquoise lies. He might leave me in the middle of my chemo. I would not be so surprised. Yeah, I got cancer and so did my dog. My car won't start and my sink has a clog. My checks are bouncing but my trampoline's torn. I am not surprised because I've been warned. It's a broken world, baby. Since even Adam gave in. But there's a new world coming. That's why my song wears a grin. Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night or noon. I'm going to meet him in the sky. In the twinkling of an eye. Thank you. Love that. Love that. So a friend of mine. Oh, wait, a friend of mine said, if you leave off the Jesus part, it could be a hit song. And I'm like, I know, I know. But what hope do we have if Jesus isn't real? If right. he isn't God and if the Bible isn't true, we have nothing to sing about. I okay. say you leave the Jesus on there and let it become a hit on its own. Yeah. So, Victoria, your nature is to entertain. Uh, oftentimes, comedians use themselves as their own foils in order to not offend another person. We use ourselves as the foil for whatever the joke is. It's our deficiency. It's our shortcomings. It's our problems. It's our life. And we put a comedic spin on that. How do you do that with breast cancer? And what motivated you to share these devotionals uh, to help people through? Because there's all of you in here. There's your husband is in here. I know he didn't like the part that he played, but it's a part he played and you covered him. Well, I think I overshared. And my family was like, you know, it's a great book if you leave out the stuff about daddy. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, I know I overshared. Um, I think I just feel sorry for middle-aged women like me. I think marriage is difficult for everyone, but especially when you get breast cancer. And the two most feminine things about you are ripped away, uh, your hair and your <clears throat> chest. And um, in, in, in our culture is so saturated with looks and sex and youth. And it, it's just really hard. It's hard for the husbands, too. And I sort of, I always want to read books that are super honest. I don't want to read books that say, oh, you know, if you're a Christian, life is perfect. And no, marriage is hard. And me and my husband pray and read the Bible almost every night. We almost get divorced very often. We're both sinners and we don't believe in divorce. We've both been through a divorce 25 years ago and God hates divorce. So, you know, I wanted to just tell the truth of my cancer journey here. Uh, 
um, the reason I named it lavender hair was because for one thing, I was trying to find a wig that would feel like me. I couldn't find a scarf or a wig that felt like me. Uh, my favorite was this lavender gray one. Because the new style with those young girls is that grayish lavender hair, you know. And I wanted to be hip, not a patient, uh, not a dying person, <sighs> whatever. Uh, I, I was at my birthday party, and my hair started to grow back in, and it was growing in kind of grayish white. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty dark now, but um, maybe the chemo, like, I don't know. And I said, oh, my hair is gray. And my friend Judy said, it's not gray. It looks lavender. And in the light, it kind of did. And so then I saw out of the corner of my eye my husband going, yeah, it looks lavender. It looks lavender. And I thought that was so cute how he was always trying to make me feel pretty. And this whole thing was hard on him, too. And... So I wrote the song as like a love song to him. Yeah, that's why I named the book after this song. Victoria, um, I know that some say you might have overshared, but the realities of a couple going through this together, there are some realities and not all parties handle all things perfectly in all situations. And <laughs> I interview a lot of people on books on cancer, and it's, oh, we decided to, to embrace it together, and I shaved my head when her hair mm -hmm. fell out, and we did all this together, and it was beautiful, and it was wonderful. And I'm thinking, you're going to tell me that you endured Okay, nine hours of drip irrigation into your arm, vomiting, um, $10,000 prescription bill, uh, getting a letter from the hospital saying you owe this month, month much, <laughs> talking to the insurance company and getting into those battles, and everything was perfect and wonderful, and we survived cancer together and were stronger together than we ever were. <laughs> Well, you know, that's lovely, and that's your story. But real America, real classic cases is um, I don't have a handbook on what I'm supposed to do as a caretaker. I'm a hunter-gatherer. I'm a provider. I bring in a paycheck. I pay the mortgage. I pay the bills. Now you're telling me you're sick. Okay, we'll get you to the doctor, but now I got to do this and I got to do that and I can't say this and I can't say that. And you know what? Mm. I'm going to do it wrong and nobody ever talks about it. Oh, thank you for saying that. You're and, right. And I read this and I looked at it and said, you know what? I can see if he will allow himself to be... Um, every man, if he'll allow himself to be the real guy, the average guy, the guy that says the wrong things, does the wrong things, because he doesn't know, because nobody told him, you've got these feelings, because you didn't know you had these feelings until you lost your breasts. You didn't know you had these feelings until you had the the sap of an Amazonian tree harvested and placed in an IV bag dripping into your arm and you've mm -hmm. got these chemicals from unknown origin with people of unknown origin and you've trusted your entire life to them and you have your own thoughts and he doesn't know what to say. He's not trained, he's not equipped and of course if he comes off as a, uh, whatever he comes off of, he comes off as somebody who loves you, who stuck mm -hmm. by your side. And if he did 9,000 things wrong, mm -hmm. he's still there today, which means mm -hmm. that he is one of the few because so many end in divorce because of this very thing. So 
he's actually my everyman hero. And oh. you've painted him. I'm going to make him watch this because he won't finish reading my book. I'm right. going to make him watch that. That was the most beautiful monologue I've ever heard. Well, it's true. He messed up in the places he messed up. He said the wrong things in the places he was supposed to say the wrong things. His script was written different. And he didn't have a script writer and he didn't have the Harvard guys to write the scene. He had to live it out by his own nature and deal with his own fear of losing the love of his life that he had known for so many years. Yes, you are, as you know. No, he said it'd be the saddest two seconds of his life when well, I died. You know what? Maybe that was a joke. Maybe. <laughs> Could be. It's a good line for uh, uh, somebody. <laughs> you know, you're going to hear it on a sitcom, so we better give you the credit for it now. You want to hear the jokes I came up with about I cancer? I do. Okay, this one's a little edgy. Just a warning. <clears throat> so people wondered, hey, did cancer affect the romance in your marriage? And I say no, because even though I was bald and I looked like a surfboard, my husband's a leg man. <laughs> well, I used to say it and my chest looked like it went through a wood chipper. But my friend said that was too harsh. I should change it to surfboard. And then my other joke was, um, well, that one's way too edgy, I think. Okay, and my other one is, uh, people say, how did cancer change your life? And I said, well, I was retired. I was already sleeping late, going to bed late, watching YouTube all day and eating vitamins. So it didn't change at all. <laughs> you know. And then my other funny thing is uh, people's reaction. Uh, one lady said, Oh, cancer doesn't run in your family? Then I could get it. And I just thought it was a funny moment because it was like, it is sad that you have it, but oh, I could get it. You know? <laughs> like then it would be a tragedy if she got cancer. <laughs> One of the things that is, I think, most endearing about these devotions is the transparency Comedians make their livelihood out of saying what other people think. The comedian is the one who's willing to step out and say, and that's why the audience laughs, because they understand that thought. They understand that expression. You open yourself up in this devotion on cancer to some self-examination, to some understanding, but with what sustained you to step out and write and share a real story. A real story that may sustain a marriage, a real story that may stay, sustain the hope of uh, somebody who is struggling with cancer. Uh, it is something that uh, because many people know you, you weren't using this to elevate yourself to be recognized again, but now as the uh, former star of Saturday Night Live cancer survivor, you have real biblical truth that you're trying to share in a way that will reach people that may not pick up that devotional or that devotional or that one because that person is a televangelist and that person is a uh, uh, politician and that person is a well-known fashion model. You want people to pick it up because you're an ordinary but extraordinary person who left show business to raise a family, who loves the Lord, and who went through an experience that is comical and tragic, 
but you come out on the side of it with a complete faith. And you drug your husband along with you, <laughs> kicking and streaming the entire way. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that real? Yeah. Life is hard. You know, you know, do you know how many people have breast cancer now? Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Jody Messina, a, a lot of celebrities, but I mean a lot of non-celebrities, but it's so common now. Oh, the, you wanted to talk about my lollipop addiction. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I, you know, when I found out I had cancer, I immediately was trying to find out how did I get it. Uh, I felt very convicted and guilty about the amount of Chardonnay I have sipped during my life. Uh, uh, that was my one weakness, uh, just to get through difficult things. It, and I wrote in there, it wasn't like I had any DUIs or I was hanging from a chandelier, but a lot of sips, you know. And, and I justified it because Jesus turned water into wine and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the internet said alcohol causes breast cancer. So I thought, wow, well, I should share that in my book. Maybe I can prevent some young women from doing that. However, half of my friends who have breast cancer never drank or smoked. So nobody really knows exactly the cause. But I think if you overdo anything, it's bad for your body. Um, then the internet said sugar uh, feeds, the body thinks it's estrogen or something, I don't know, I don't know science very good. M my cancer fed on estrogen and, and they, and something about sugar and alcohol, they're chemically similar. And so, uh, I was thinking, you know, well, I won't drink anymore, but what about my bubble gum and my lollipop fixation, which is my stress relief? Because as you can see, I bite my nails and, uh, my whole life I've struggled with, you know, something to relieve stress that's healthy. And I was a gymnast, so I work out. I know all about that working out stuff. But, um, yeah. So I try to limit my lollipop intake. By the way, C's lollipops are the best. If anybody's trying to quit smoking or something, C's lollipop. I'm not getting paid to be their sponsor, spokesperson or anything. But yeah, I, I, I just think all the things that taste good are bad for you, and it's hard to be human. It's hard to be in this flesh, and uh, that's why the Bible is so exciting. Someday this will be gone, and we'll have a new body. You get very personal in the book, <clears throat> and in the way you get personal, uh, is very transparent. You share very real moments. I don't know that I have seen uh, as candid and godly a view of the experience. Uh, when you were writing this devotional, what was it that you were hoping it would accomplish? Were you writing it for you as a vessel to just express, or was this a way for you to try to get people to who were dealing with breast cancer to weigh into the realities and to the faithfulness of God to sustain you even through a bad diagnosis? Well, I have several thoughts about that. My first my 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 fleshly my human instinct was to write about my cancer year just to get it out of my system like i write songs to exp you know i think all good art comes from pain but i think ann lamott might have said that i might be quoting her but um i wanted to just get it out just just to get it out of my head so whether anyone read it or not you know people call it journaling I don't like to call it that. I like to call it writing a big hit bestseller. You know, I don't like the word journaling. But anyway, um, 
So I just want to get it out. My, my main reason for living is to glorify God, to further his kingdom, to spread the gospel. My goal in life is to tell as many people as possible the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and resurrected, which makes me cry. Because Franklin Graham always tells the gospel, no matter what he's on, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham. You could say to Franklin Graham, hey, isn't it a pretty day? And he would say, Jesus was died, buried, and resurrected for our sins. And I'm like, Franklin, thank you. Because that, that is the power of God. That, that is the gospel. Jesus' death, burial, and, re and resurrection. Anyway, so my goal, my main goal was, hey, if anyone ever read it, I want to spread the gospel. I want to share with people who would never open a Bible the exciting news that sin separates us from God, but Jesus, God, died for our sins. You know, we need a blood sacrifice like you, Rabbi, are an expert when the Israelites had to uh, sacrifice a spotless lamb for their right. sins. And I never could figure out why God told them to do that, except that it might prevent them from sinning, to have to kill a beautiful little innocent lamb. Is, do you think that's why he said that? I know the verse, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And maybe you have to have death for life. But God is so much smarter than, than me. But why do you think God said you have to kill a sheep if, for your sins? Well, <clears throat> fundamentally, that when we give something, when we sacrifice, give back, take from our wealth, take back from our everything we have, it's a part of us. It's something we think we own. We're sacrificing it back to God, uh, returning it to the one it belongs to, but it is a sign of obedience. And, you know, God's the creator of the animal. The animal belonged to God to begin with. So it's not as if we are bringing harm to something that is ours. We're returning it to the one who owns it. And he's saying, if you're obedient, you allow your flock to be reduced and to honor me. And I will bring the increase. And if you're faithful in these things, you'll see the increase. Well, wait a second. I just reduced. Yes, but in that reduction, you've opened up the door to an increase. And so be faithful in all things. So it's about wealth, not about killing a cute little sheep. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's why you're the rabbi. <laughs> Anyway, so my reason for writing the book was, my human reason was to get it out of my system. My, I wanted the challenge of a creative project because I was so bored laying in bed like a zombie for five months. And my, uh, my spiritual most important purpose for writing it was to spread the gospel that people could be saved and go to heaven. And what kind of response are you getting? Interesting. You should ask that. Like I said, my family thinks it was too much oversharing. My uh, husband won't finish it, but he's a good guy. And I'm going to make him watch your monologue. Uh, I met this woman at uh, CBN uh, at the 700 Club, yes. and she loved it. And she, but see, she has so much in common with me. She's blonde. She's in the uh, TV business. She totally related to this pressure of how, trying to be skinny and all of the little tricks women do to try to be thin or attractive, especially if it's their career or to be looked at and get a husband. She totally re re related. And I, it made me feel so good. I was like, oh, someone gets me. Someone understands and she's a Christian, so she liked it a lot. Um, I, no, it just came out, so I haven't really read any reviews or anything. So your husband won't finish it because he's... <laughs> he's... Um, <clears throat> Offended. Well, I have a, mes I have a message for him that... Um, 
if he will allow God to use it for his purposes, that the families that go through what you went through will find out that it's normal and that you will survive it and you'll survive it together and that it's a message of encouragement that men can be men and hey husband there he is right now well, say hi we're talking about you and how awesome you are to go through cancer with me hey how are you <laughs> good let me get you on camera for just a minute Hey, come here. He wants you on camera. Okay. Put your face. Oh, Paul, put your face right here. Come on. You're so cute. Just for a minute. Come on. Right okay. here. Right here. Say I wanna, hi. I, I want to give you a word. I want to give you a word of encouragement. How are you? I'm, I'm well. I want to give you this a word. This is the rabbi. I want to give you a word of encouragement. That the, who you are portrayed as in the book, you may and the family may consider it to be a negative uh, reflection, you were real. And because you were real, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of couples struggling with trying to be perfect, and you can't be perfect in this situation. And you as a real husband didn't come with a handbook with the proper responses and with the right attitudes and preparation and have to deal with the fear of losing your wife and seeing her in pain, and the way men respond is completely different than women, and what you went through was real and natural. And because your wife has portrayed it that way, I want to encourage you, I've read it, it's not negative, it's real. And if there's couples out there that are willing to embrace the reality of the ups and downs of a really very real relationship that's transparent, then you're a hero, not a heel, because you've allowed yourself to be real, and she's portrayed you as real, not as well, good he does, or not okay, as Okay, but Rabbi, he, he does say that my recollection of events is a little different than his. Right, and but, his, and his he, recollection is there's, right, there's, and yours was drug-induced. I, I, I greatly appreciate your words of wisdom and encouragement. Thank you so very much. Well, you're Thank welcome. you. God bless you for that. But we've run out of time. Victoria, Victoria Jackson of Saturday Night Live, fame and fortune, many movies, great entertainer, lavender hair, 21 devotions of women with breast cancer. I strongly encourage you to get this. Victoria, what a delight it's been to get to know you, to call you friend, and I'll see you in Nashville in a couple of months. We'll get together and we'll talk some more. Until then... We tell you, shalom, we love you, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Mwah! Mwah! And that brings to an end our live broadcast day. We thank you for watching on the Ignatian Nation Broadcasting Network and this program revealing the truth. These episodes will rerun all throughout the day and later this evening will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and then tomorrow you can watch them on WNDTV. Thank you. We You're thank well. you for continuing to support us through your contributions and through your kind words, following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Until we see you back here live tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. right here in the studio, we bid you shalom.